oh, I didn't see you there. I was just changing the oil in this telephone switch. A few folks said they'd like to know a little bit more about the trouble recorder. And if that's you, you're in luck, because we're going to talk about it for a while. This is it here, and we just got it working again recently. Now, the, f the first thing to know is that this isn't the original recorder that was here. The original one is actually back behind, and it has a drive shaft that's really messed up. And it was decided that it was so hard to fix that it would be better for us just to mount the spare one here in the bay and figure out what to do with the broken one later. The only problem was this one didn't work either. And a little bit later in the video, I'll talk about what we had to do to fix it and get it punching cards again. The trouble recorder's job is to punch trouble records. The records themselves are these long cards with a bunch of letters and numbers on them. There's roughly a thousand places on each side of the card that can be perforated. And basically, these are the 1950s version of a stack trace. What they're telling you is what parts of the switch were in use when an error occurred, and if possible, how far the call was able to complete before it encountered the error. If there's anything out of the ordinary happening, the card also has spots for that too. Similar to the kinds of debug messages you might see on a computer, they don't necessarily tell you what caused the problem. Instead, they tell you what the problem was, and what was happening at the time of the problem. And from that information, you had to figure out the root cause. You did that in a few ways. First, you can use the information on this card to recreate the entire call on the master test frame. By looking at the card, I can see exactly where the call originated from, which marker was involved in completing it, and the exact path it took to get through the switching fabric. So, by writing that up on these keys here, we can set up the number 5 to place that exact call again, right down to using the exact same equipment and the exact same input and output that it used the first time. If the problem happens again, we're in luck. Now, I'll just go over here and busy out the affected equipment so that other calls aren't impacted. So the trouble recorder is super useful for debugging the number 5 crossbar. But before we talk about how it works, let's quickly talk about how we got to this point. In the much older panel switch, there were a few thousand individual selector circuits, all controlled by anywhere from 50 to 200 senders. If a particular piece of equipment encountered a fault, that equipment would stick and sound an alarm. Central office maintenance personnel then walked over to the equipment and observed the state it was in and fixed the problem. Daily routine testing allowed most issues to be located before they impacted too many subscribers. If a subscriber did report trouble, a maintenance ticket was created and sent to the switch room for testing and resolution. Since there were thousands of selector circuits, each individual selector could handle perhaps a few hundred calls a day. If routine testing was carried out at daily intervals, then a troublesome selector could be identified quickly before it caused too many problems. But this changed when the panel switch first got decoders in 1927. Decoders were complex circuits that were responsible for translating an office code into a terminal location on the district frame. They replaced an earlier system of translation, and a single decoder in a busy office could handle 80,000 calls a day. Most panel offices had between three and six of these decoders. Because of their complexity and capacity for handling translations for an enormous amount of call traffic, decoders were the first pieces of apparatus to have their very own trouble indicating panels. When a decoder failed, it rang a bell and lit these lights. A switchman recorded the lights on a special form and took the decoder out of service for repair. This pattern was continued in the number one crossbar in the 1930s and 40s. Here, two trouble indicating frames were provided, one for originating markers 
and one for terminating markers. If a failure was encountered in completing a call, the marker called in its respective trouble indicator and lit lamps that displayed its state at the time of the failure. From these lamps, you can determine the exact parts of the system that were in use and what relays were operated in the marker that led to the failure. Control circuits like decoders and markers have a holding time of a fraction of a second. And because of this, it's almost impossible to observe a failure as it happens in real time, unless you already know exactly what you're looking for. Also, trouble might only occur on specific calls with particular sets of input and output. So without knowing the exact state of the system when the failure occurred, it might take a very long time before you could figure out what caused the problem. These light up trouble indicating panels were super important for diagnosing and correcting problems in these machines. The only downside of this method was that switchmen had to spend too much of their time writing down lamp indications on these forms. And if another issue occurred while someone was recording the first problem, the display was lost and the second issue might go unresolved. The designers of the number 5 crossbar recognized these limitations and began looking for ways to improve how the system reported trouble. This task became really important because of the vast complexity of the number 5's markers. Knowing how important they were and understanding that a great deal of time could be saved by producing automatic and permanent records of failures, the trouble recorder was created. So I should mention that not all number 5 crossbar offices had trouble recorders. Some had uh, an OTF, or office test frame, which is this behind me. The OTF had flashing lights just like the earlier crossbar offices did. Now, which one you had, the OTF or the full master test frame with the trouble recorder, really depended on two things. Uh, how much floor space you had and how much money you had. For smaller offices that served maybe a few thousand customers, uh, you probably didn't need the full trouble recorder setup and therefore there was no reason to pay for it. And maybe you didn't really have the floor space for it in the first place. But in larger offices where you were serving many, many, many thousands of customers, the trouble recorder might have been a better idea. This office test frame behind me isn't hooked up, but the Telephone Museum in Ellsworth, Maine has theirs hooked up so if you're ever in their neck of the woods and you want to see the number five crossbar with the office test frame, you should stop by and see them. So how were markers able to tell when they had a problem? Well, there's three major ways. There's cross detection, input validation, and timer failures. Now we already talked about cross detection. So let's take a minute to go over the other two. Validation is how the marker checks that the information it's sending and receiving is correct. In the number 5, all the digits that the system uses are stored using 2 out of 5 encoding. Each digit, 0 through 9, is always represented by 2 bits. Each bit can have one of 5 values, 0, 1, 2, 4, or 7. By adding any two values together, we can represent any digit with the exception of zero. For that, we use four and seven. This is actually pretty clever because it's relatively unlikely that two bits will go bad at exactly the same time. And the checking circuit for this is simple enough that it's cost effective to use everywhere. Here's an example of a card that was dropped because of a validation failure. From this card, I can tell that it was marker zero that was trying to process the call. The call was a terminating call, and the marker was in the process of setting up the actual terminating connection. And if we look at the digits that were transferred to the marker from the incoming register, we can see that the first digit was a two, that's two and zero. The next digit was, we don't know because these should be, there should be two bits that are asserted here, one and something else. And then the rest of the digits are fine. The missing bit in the B digit is what actually caused this card to be dropped because the marker detected there was a problem. But I should point out when we're talking about this that the last digit that's transmitted is always a high seven. 
And that's the one time it's okay to have an exception to the two out of five rule. The seven is sort of like a stop bit almost, or, or not really a parody bit, but it's, it's a signal to the marker that whatever the digit previous to this seven was is the actual last digit that the marker has to pay attention to. So this is the only time we should be getting just a single high seven. So the, what we have to do here is go and fix the bad bit in the B register of this incoming register. In addition to checking all input and output, markers have four timers that are used to detect failures that aren't caught by the previous two methods. The work timer is the shortest of the four, only a fraction of a second. In a single marker operation, the work timer will recycle several times. Its job is to time individual circuit operations local to the marker frame. For example, the marker expects relay B to operate within a few milliseconds of relay A. If it doesn't, that will cause the work timer to expire and produce a trouble record. If the operation of relay B is within the allotted time, the work timer will recycle to time the next operation. The short timer is used when the marker has to access other frames external to itself. It lasts about three seconds. If the marker is unable to access an external frame or resource within that time, a trouble record will be taken. The long timer is used when the marker needs to make a trouble record, but the recorder is in use by another piece of equipment. When the trouble recorder indicates that it's busy, the short timer will be replaced by the long timer. This gives the marker another couple of seconds to wait for the recorder to be available before it drops the call onto an intercept recording or a busy signal and releases. Finally, the overall timer expires after about 13 seconds. It's a fail-safe timer that kicks in if everything else doesn't work. Usually, if you reach the OAT expiration, then there is something very, very wrong that caused all of the previous timers not to work. During my time at the museum, I have never seen the overall timer kick in, which is a good thing. There's special perforations on the trouble card to indicate which timer fired. The timing requirements for various marker operations are detailed in the schematics. So if you know which timer expired, and what the marker was doing when the timer expired, you can narrow down a list of possible causes. There's also sequence charts that show the progression of the marker's operation in time. And by looking at the progress punches up here, we can follow the sequence chart to where the last major progress relay operated. When a marker encounters a failure and needs to create a trouble record, a special relay operates which stops all progress at that point. This momentarily freezes the state of the marker and any circuits it was connected to so that the status can be recorded properly. Now, the marker bids for access to the trouble recorder by connecting itself to the Master Test Connector, or MTC for short. The MTC is a very wide parallel bus that concentrates several thousand leads from around the machine to this point here. Assuming the recorder is available, the MTC operates these multi-contact relays, which close about 1,200 individual leads into the test and recorder circuit. Each of these 1,200 leads may or may not be grounded, depending on whether or not the particular relay or circuit was operated during the time that trouble occurred. And it's these grounds that are going to actually operate the magnets over in the trouble recorder. But hang on, because we're not quite there yet. We can't just send 1,200 wires directly into the recorder because we can't fit 1,200 punch magnets in there. So we need to close the leads to the recorder 120 at a time, in sync with the card advance to operate the right magnets at the right moment. There's a series of scanning relays that divide up the leads into sets of 120. Each time a scanning relay closes, two lines are punched in the card, up to 60 holes per line. The scanning relays that close the grounds to the magnets are controlled by a cam box that lives inside the recorder. It's connected to the main drive system, so the cams rotate any time the recorder motor is running. 
as the cams rotate, they close contacts that operate the scanning relays. These scanning relays operate in sync with the card as it steps its way through the machine. If we look at the scanning relays while a record's being taken, we can see them all operate in turn. Each time a relay operates, one pair of lines is being punched in the card. The synchronism of the cams, the card advance, and the scanning relays is critical to the operation of the trouble recorder. The grounds on the scanning relays directly control the punches, and if they were to close at the wrong time, the punches may operate while the card is in motion, causing the machine to jam. In order to understand what happens next, we need to talk about the parts of the recorder. Looking at it from the front, we see the punch magnets, the links, and the latches. We can also see the oscillating shuttle bar. This bar is driven back and forth very quickly by a cam inside the machine. In the back of the recorder, there's an identical set of magnets, links, and latches that we could ignore for now since their action is identical to what happens here in the front. Here's a side cutaway view showing a punch magnet, its link, and the latch. We can also see the oscillating shuttle bar as this blue rectangle here. On the inside of the machine, not visible to us in real life, are the interposers, which are attached to the latch mechanism. Finally, we have the actual punches, shown in red, and a constantly rotating cam, seen here. Once the recorder is running, the shuttle bar is constantly in motion, moving in and out. The shuttle bar has dwell periods at each extreme end of its motion. At these dwell periods, it stops moving for a tiny fraction of a second. At the outer dwell period, when the shuttle bar is closest to us, the magnets for the selected punches operate from grounds from the scanning relays that have just closed. The operated magnets pull upward on these latches, causing the latches to close like a jaw onto the oscillating shuttle bar. Now, the shuttle bar begins to move inwards, and as it does so, it drags the operated latches and interposers along with it. The ones that have been pulled inwards are now sitting right on top of their punches. Now, during the shuttle bar's inner dwell period, the cam presses downwards on the interposers, which press down on their punches, causing those spots in the card to be perforated. Once the perforation is complete, the punches are retracted and the oscillating shuttle bar carries the interposers and latches back out to the home position. The card moves forward one line, and the entire operation takes place again. A complete card is punched in about one second. The card transport is actually quite clever. It's driven by a Geneva mechanism and a pair of clutches. When the first of the two clutches engages, the Geneva gear is advancing the card one step at a time. When the card has finished punching, a separate clutch kicks in to quickly eject the card and carry the next one off the stack and into the ready position. The Geneva gear and most of the clutch mechanism is hidden inside a metal housing but you can see the intermittent clutch engage in slow motion here. Kind of like a manual transmission in a car, a selector arm is determining which of the two clutches will engage, and hence whether the car transport will be intermittent for punching or continuous for ejecting. I mentioned before that this recorder wasn't working. 
I don't remember when we last had a working trouble recorder, but it hasn't been the last five years or so. With this recorder, cards always jammed once they were inside the machine. To be honest, I was a bit afraid to work on it, since they don't exactly make replacement parts for these anymore, and not knowing what was wrong with it, I didn't want to cause any more damage than had already been done. After reading the documentation, though, I discovered a few major issues that contributed to cards jamming. The first was the card transport mechanism. See these weird notches in the card? These are really important. The cards are actually fed through the machine by chains with these little shoes on them. The shoes grab the notches in the card and pull it off the stack and through the machine. One of the shoes had a weak spring which had to be replaced. Luckily, we had spares for those. The other transport problem was these guys here. So this is the, the part of the throat mechanism and there is a gap right there, an identical one on this side. And this is the gap that only allows one card to pass into the machine and, and not two. And part of the problem was that these throats, the ones that were over there installed in the machine, this gap was too large at 11 thou, and this gap on this one was too small at 8 thou. They have to be uh, between 9 and 10. And what happens is when you get a gap that's too large, it'll allow two cards to flow into the body of the machine, and you really only want to allow one. So one card should fit in between there, ideally, but two cards should not. And that's, I mean, they barely do if you force them, but that's the, uh, that's the tolerance with that. The second problem turned out to be a phasing issue. I mentioned before that there are cams that close relays to operate the punches at the proper times. Turns out that those cams were all out of phase with the main shuttle mechanism. So in effect, the punches were operating while the card was being moved forwards. The phase relationship between these cams, the oscillating shuttle bar, and the card transport mechanism is really complex. And if anything's out of alignment, you're going to have a bad day. The other tricky thing about it is that many adjustments have an effect on other adjustments. So whenever you change one thing, you have to change everything else to match it. Now that we could punch cards, we noticed that not all of the holes were reliably punching, and some holes were punching on lines where they didn't belong. The trouble recorder is no good if it doesn't consistently punch the correct holes, and this is where slow-mo photography really came in helpful. Using my iPhone camera, we took slow-mo video of the magnets as they operated. I could tell by watching the video that the magnet timing was correct, so something else had to be wrong. It turns out that gunk and old lubricant had gummed up the interposer jaws, so even if the magnet operated and released on time, the jaws didn't lock up and release on time. This is what caused holes to be missed or punched twice. So I began the painstaking work of disconnecting each of these links from its relay armature and cleaning all the built-up oil and gunk off of them. There's 120 punches in all, so you can imagine this took a few days. After reattaching each link, each punch had to be individually adjusted to within the spec. Luckily, the recorder has a test circuit that we can use to punch repeatable patterns on the cards. This helps to make sure that everything's working okay. After about a week of work, the trouble recorder is now operating reliably. The harder part will be getting new cards printed and cut. The cards we have will last for a while, 
but we'll eventually need more. So you might be wondering where we get all the cards from. For now, they come from storage. We have 6,400 of the right cards and 9,600 of the wrong cards. Um, so that's two boxes of these and three boxes of these. The cards look pretty identical. However, the punches on them are all the labels are on them are in different places. Uh, additionally, the wrong cards are single-sided, while the correct cards are double-sided. There is a punch on the front of the card that indicates that you should turn the card over and read the back side. What we've been doing is using the wrong cards for testing and doing other throwaway things with the punch, and we've been using the correct cards only when we really want to take a reading. So. Until we figure out how to get more cards made, this is kind of got what we got to do. Anyway, I hope you liked the video. If you did, you can like and subscribe, which I hear makes the algorithm happy. Um, and uh, otherwise, in any case, we'll, we'll see you next time. Bye.